One, two, three. Down. Exciting day. <laughs> One, two, three. Same roof, different apartment. Hi, YouTube. Hello. So, two and a half years later, we're going to talk about sight reading again. I actually had to torture myself a little or a lot by watching my old vlog. Just to make sure that I don't repeat myself, I'm still wearing blue. And just to recap for you, I talked about six tips and I had quotations around tips because I didn't think that I had the authority to be giving out tips. And I still, to this day, don't think I necessarily have an authority to give advice or tips, but these are just some things that I've gathered and hopefully my experiences can help you in some way. So to recap, the six things were one, keep reading, keep reading, and keep reading. Music is like a foreign language. Two, don't be afraid to make mistakes because you want to get a bigger picture and once you have that bigger picture, it becomes a goal for you to strive towards. Three, listen to lots and lots of music so that you can pick up patterns. Four, know your scales, know the basics. Five, know a bit of music theory. I have to pause here for a second. I actually disagree with what I said in that vlog regarding this point. Music theory might not be the most essential thing, but I think it definitely helped knowing progressions of chords. I actually think it is essential and I I think I downplayed the importance of music theory at the time because I didn't want people to think and I still don't want anyone to think that music theory is something that you can only learn in a privileged place. So that's probably why I said that. Now, two and a half years later, I will say that music theory is essential and it's actually not super hard to learn on your own. There are some books already. I might attempt to look for some recommendations. None of them are sponsored. These are just some I have seen in the past. I can also link actually some of the books I had when I was at Juilliard for those music theory classes. Maybe those will help, but it's been quite a few years, so I don't know what the current curriculum is. And the last thing, the sixth thing that I said in that vlog was to reward yourself with a cookie or with a big meal, just because sight reading is very exhausting and can be very exhausting at least. So you want to reward yourself and you don't want to make yourself pass out <laughs> at the end of sight reading. So now, two and a half years later, to make things a little bit more interesting and perhaps a little bit more helpful, I'm going to answer four comments from my sight reading chef and vlog, which if for some reason you haven't seen it yet, I'll link it up there. And then I will choose some examples based on your responses on Instagram. I asked you for pieces that you would like me to analyze and tell you immediately what I would point out when I'm sight reading a piece like that. So there will be two parts to this vlog. I hope this will be helpful for you in some way. First comment is from Candace. Do you always sight read a piece first, then dig into the details? Do you ever just play one hand at a time, then put it together? It depends on the piece, if it's something that is easy and not like a four voice fugue by Bach, you know, then I would try to sight read and just get an overall picture, like what I said two and a half years ago. It's still something that I do and it's been something that I've done for the past 18 years of playing the piano. I will attempt to sight read the entire piece first, both hands together, just to get a sense of what's going on. But of course, there are also instances like Bach fugues and also just something a bit more virtuosic or complicated technically that will just make me stop in the middle and not be able to continue sight reading both hands. In that case, I might just look at the score a little bit, identify what I would need to work on later, and still get a rough picture and then try to move on to easier parts later, perhaps in a piece. So yeah, I do sight read first and then dig into the details later. Ash asked, what was your technique before for learning to play difficult runs or polyrhythms like ones in this Chopin piece? Would you ever clap the rhythm or listen to a recording to hear the rhythm? Um, I still, two and a half years later, stand by the statement that I do not think I'm particularly an excellent sight reader. I just think that I have had the experience of knowing music and just playing lots and lots of music. So I know the patterns, I kind of already expect certain harmonies and certain structures or melodies that will come up. So 
that's why it might seem like I'm good at sight reading, but I just think it's all from experience, nothing special. So to answer your first question, I don't have any special technique for learning those difficult runs. I probably encountered or I definitely encountered similar runs like this that you saw in the Shepard piece. I'm guessing you mean this. Of course, the very first time that I experienced and saw these kinds of runs, I was not immediately able to play them like I did when you saw that vlog. But that vlog, it's after many, many years of experience of playing and encountering Chopin's music. You see me immediately being able to play it because I picked up patterns. So that's a very practical application of one of the points that I said. Probably when I was a kid, when I first saw this difficult run, I would attempt to play it kind of, but then just kind of move past it, work on it later after the initial sight reading sessions. To your second question, I don't really clap the rhythm. Sometimes I may need a metronome to understand where the rhythms fit, but that's mostly for chamber music. I've found myself having a bit more trouble understanding rhythm in chamber music. Oh, that reminds me, when I was at Juilliard pre-college, we did a lot of rhythm exercises for polyrhythm. I'll link the books down for you just for your reference in case you're curious. Those probably helped me a lot without me realizing the direct application, but we did a lot of those ta 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 stuff. <laughs> Good times. Nina asks, what are your most efficient tips on becoming better at sight reading? I've been playing the piano for 11 years now, yet sight reading and being able to actually play a piece at first glance is still a struggle for me. Well, if you've been playing for 11 years and you're still having trouble sight reading, I would think that it has something to do with your mental approach rather than something that you're lacking in skills. Because I think after 11 years of playing, you have enough data and enough knowledge and experience to be able to sight read. So I would say it's all about having self-confidence and being unapologetic when you sight read. I was very lucky that I was never surrounded by people who knew music or had any knowledge of the pieces that I was playing. So they didn't really know or care that I was playing horribly when I was sight reading. So you have to just not be self-conscious. Be confident that you can sight read and do it and really push through. No matter how difficult the pieces are, or how frustrated you are, or hopeless you might feel, just keep going and keep striving. I just believe in you. I mean, 11 years is a lot of experience. So I just think you have to believe in yourself and it's something about adjusting your mental approach. And to those of you who might be starting out, just know that eventually as years pass and as you get more and more experience of knowing the music, and listening and just experiences in general help you so much. So don't be discouraged if you're not so good at it in the beginning. I was horrible at it, obviously. I mean, it's like comparing yourself to someone who's been speaking a language for many, many years and then saying that you have trouble reading a book in that language when you're just starting out the first few years. It's just not fair to compare and you have to be kind to yourself. I will quote one of my patrons who sent me a nice message saying that I should be kind to myself, not only to others. And that's very applicable, I think, also in this scenario. The last comment is from AVM. I usually have a bit of a trouble when I sight read a piece on an exam. So my question is, what should we look for in the piece that we're going to sight read? Also, how do you sight read something that has a bunch of 30 second notes like you did in this video? To answer your second question, it's similar to my answer to the difficult runs in the previous question. For your first question, I think this is time for the second part of this vlog where I actually tell you as examples how I approach sight reading and what I look for at first glance. So let's go to that side of the piano. Hello. So we're at the piano. I am going to completely improvise this. I have not thought about how I'm going to explain this, but I know that there are sight reading exams. It's been a long time since I've done any sight reading exams, but I did look this up that you have 
about 30 seconds to look at a score and then you have to sight read. So I thought I would give myself a similar time limit, although because I speak slower than I think, I'm gonna give myself one minute. I stand corrected. Now that I have tried to explain this in 60 seconds, it is actually impossible. Also, technically for those sight reading exams, you're never being asked to sight read the entire movement. It's usually just like one or two pages now. Anyway, I'm going to extend this to two minutes. I hope that's okay. So I picked four pieces, one per main era. So there's a Baroque, there is a classical, there's romantic, and then there is impressionist. I do know these pieces already, so this might be a bit weird for you to see, but these are just things that I would immediately know and recognize when I see the score. And just because I know these pieces doesn't detract anything from that. Also, I'm not sight reading any new pieces at the moment because I'm preparing for the 29th for the live stream concert. Anyway, I'm gonna try to push through and be as helpful as I can in two minutes about partita number two, Symphonia, what I see at first glance. Go. So, C minor. Nothing so surprising because you see B natural, you know you're in harmonic minor. So if you know harmonies of C minor and if you've done any sorts of exercises in analyzing chorales, this is giving me flashback of music theory classes, you will be very, very fine with the first section. And Dante, you basically just focus on the right hand. Again, harmonies is very important to know because the left hand essentially is just lining out the harmonies in eighth notes, a walking bass, and I love, love, love the melody with the right hand. So nothing much that I can say here, I don't think. Let's go to the fugue. I would never be able to sight read the entire thing at first glance with both hands. I'm not a magician or an expert in sight reading. So if you're scared, I would be scared too. You basically see where the entrances are. That's something that I would immediately look at. And you identify patterns like this. This is like a spin off and then entrance. Even though I can't sight read at first glance both hands at the same time, I would still attempt to try to figure out when the entrances come in, when there's new materials, and when there are patterns, like this. Basically, if you know the first one, you know the next two. You kind of get the idea. So. There's only so much you can say in two minutes. Basically, there are more and more patterns. Oh, that reminds me. Someone asked about how you know which finger to put in which key. A lot of it has to do with knowing your scales. If you know the scale of C minor, here, it's a C minor scale going up. So if you already know it, you don't have to freak out about, ah, so many notes and there are 30 second notes. Another tip-ish about knowing which fingers to put where is just prioritizing using all five fingers. A lot of them are not really rocket science. They kind of just give you the hint what fingers to use, like here. You want to use all five. Hope that helps. We've got Beethoven. It is the 250th anniversary of Beethoven, but also a lot of you as expected, of course, because Moonlight Sonata is so popular. You wanted me to talk about Moonlight Sonata. So let's talk about it. Do we even need to talk about the fact that this is in C-sharp minor? It's so obvious. So I'm gonna say that before the two minute mark. Go. So this whole entire movement is pretty straightforward. You have this. This is why you need to know your scales of arpeggios, but this is not really, you know, that kind of a pregio, but you just have to know this configuration, then you can play all the other ones coming up. Do 
I need to explain? I don't think so. So it's pretty straightforward. C sharp minor going up. Black going up. Going up. And it's split into, I would say, one section here, second section kind of, but it's all in one. And then you have like a A prime because it seems like it's going to repeat the same thing again after that fermata, but then it gets into a different harmony and then transitions into the theme. And this theme comes back because it is the sonata form. So you already know that the same thing is going to happen here on this page later. In the recap, you know the same thing is going to happen, so that's the structure of it. So you have the theme here, and then you have the transition into something else. The transition kind of goes into the second part, development. Again, if you know this configuration already, you pretty much know half the piece. <laughs> the first theme in a different key that transitions into an entire development section. You just have to know your Alberti configurations really well with this. If you know that configuration, you're set. You just have to focus on the melody in the left hand. Recap, exact same thing happens, except you've got a coda section here. I keep getting cut off with this two minute, so this two minute timer might not be super helpful, but at least it keeps me super condensed in my explanation. A few things I would work on is knowing this configuration, knowing your Alberti stuff, the Alberti bass, and knowing C sharp minor harmonies will make you less freaked out, I think. Knowing your scales. What else? I don't know if I have anything else helpful to say about this. It's a very classical structure. Things repeat themselves a lot. And so once you know certain motifs and certain configurations and passages, you will just be able to play the rest of the stuff. You can do it. Wow, I'm just repeating myself over and over again. Know your harmonies. Next up is Chopin. Of course, it's ballad number one, of course. <laughs> Oh, so much writing, it's kind of hard to see the notes. I feel like I'm gonna say the same exact thing. I am sorry that I cannot be a lot more original, but here's my attempt. Two minutes, go. So, if you're sight reading this, you have to know your harmonies because this configuration, I mean, don't play them like you're farting, but you know, it's all just harmonies, G minor, G minor first inversion. You don't have to know these labels, but you kind of just have to know where they are on the keyboards or which notes they are at least. That helps you a lot. D major chord helps a lot so that I immediately see the chords, boom, like that. Now on to, I guess, a little bit more difficult stuff. You see some patterns also, but this is romantic error, so it's not as structurally repetitive, like, for example, in Bach or Beethoven. And here, I spent a lot of time drilling those scales and passages. Hmm, if you're sight reading this, again, this is kind of like spelling out the harmonies, but in a romantic way, not like a Bach way, you know? So it's lyrical kind of spelling out the harmonies. Same here. And then you've got more chords and harmony things. See, this is all just spelling out a certain chord, B7. So if you knew that, you would not be so freaked out by all of that. Passages that I drilled a lot about. <laughs> and again, a lot of just lining out the harmonies. This whole thing. E flat, E flat. Woo! See, I've lived this score for many years. Um, coda, lots of people freak out about this. I spent a lot of time drilling this, but it's not that daunting in terms of note-wise. Harmonies, it's just G minor, G minor, G minor, G minor, C minor. I'm not saying you have to go about labeling every single chord that you see on a score, but these are just, these are just kind of like 
GPS coordinates for your hand, you kind of know what the keys are. The different variations, or not variations, different inversions of chords. So G minor, first inversion, second inversion. Know your harmonies. Do you get it now by this however many minutes you're into this vlog? Yeah, that's about it. For sight reading, ballad, you just need to know your harmonies and drill your scales. Man, this is so boring. I thought this would be a lot more interesting, but hopefully this is a bit more interesting because I don't know how else to explain to you. That's just kind of how I immediately recognize and see things when I look at a score. So next up and last up, we have Debussy, Claire de Lune. Oh, I already immediately know what I'm gonna say because this piece is actually very much all about colors of different harmonies. So if you know the harmonies, you will be okay. More than okay. Two minutes. So Claire de Lune. I guess this is in D flat major, although it doesn't really help so much impressionist music for me to know what key it is because they always change things up and then you end up kind of feeling lost if you fix your mind to saying that this is in a certain key. That helps a lot in other music like classical and Baroque and probably also for romantic, but impressionistic is a bit more adventurous. So I never really registered that it was in D flat major. Anyway, this piece essentially is made up of intervals. Third. And uh, of course it helps to know harmonies and chords. So this is a G flat. And then you're circling around or lining, outlining the D flat major here. So that's what it is. And a lot of unison, so it's actually quite easy. Unison. If you know roughly what the interval of a third is on keyboard, on the keys, helps. Pretty much 90% of this piece is built around the interval of a third and also chords, like very straightforward chords. Mm, you're clearly in D flat major by Un Pocomoso. Know your appreggios, but in different forms. There is a preggio here, another one here. A lot of appreggios. So basically, know the lining, lining, the outline of a chord, so that you can play around with it, like this. That's kind of what it is made up of a lot. Mm. So I guess I said one thing that's a little bit more helpful, knowing the chords and just the possibilities of them becoming passages, not really passages, more like textures like this, kind of preggios. Knowing that helps. Knowing your scales also for the preggio parts in the left hand there. I think that's about it. There's a little bit of polyrhythm actually, I should have mentioned this. When I was younger, I had trouble playing this. Yeah, this I had to really do. I think doing those ta-ta rhythm exercises help a little bit or just feel where the beat is. I don't think I did a very good job, but I tried. I think it just boils down to three things after doing this whole experiment of explaining each piece in two minutes. Boils down to knowing harmonies, knowing your scales, and identifying patterns. Seeing things in groups, not only vertically in terms of the chords, but also across different bars. Sometimes, like I said in Bach, one musical idea just gets repeated a little bit with a variation a few times later. So it's less daunting to see music in groups rather than individually each note. I think that's it for this. Uh, sight reading explanation-ish vlog. I don't know if any of this was helpful, but I try to explain to you very quickly what I see. A lot of it is just harmonies. Ultimately, music is music, but these are just kind of lenses, so you can learn it a lot quicker. 
and be efficient, but efficiency is not the goal of music. That's as much as I would like to go into harmonic analysis or music theory here. I think knowing music theory is like knowing grammar. For example, if you want to say, I like music, you never approach that sentence by telling yourself, I is a subject, like is a verb, music is an object. When you look at music, you never specifically say, this is a D flat major arpeggio, then this is this interval, and that is that interval. You just immediately see it and you play it. That's kind of the goal you want to have. You just want that immediate connection. Does that make any sense? Anyway, I tried my best, so let me know if you have any more questions. Maybe in two and a half years, I will make another sight reading explanation video. <laughs> For now, be kind and keep striving. I'll see you soon.